Welcome back to another Sunday preview here in McKinney, Texas. We're around the table getting into God's Word. I'm joined by Pastor David Thompson and Kim Nyman. Thank you all for making time today. We're glad to be Great here. to be here. All right, let's jump into God's Word on this hot July 15th. We're starting with the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, verses 1 through 6, and this speaks of the righteous branch. It says this, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people. You scattered my flock and have driven them away. And you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely, and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is a name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Okay. A lot of different ways to go with this. David, what are your initial thoughts? Well, I probably as a pastor, what jumps out to me is just the scathing judgment on those who were to be shepherds, or we translate the Greek word shepherd as pastor, uh, pastor of God's people, that they were derelict in their duty and that there were severe consequences. Um, the sheep were scattered, and the Lord takes that serious. So that, that's what jumps out at me, but then also the graciousness of the Lord, that in spite of the failure of the shepherds, he will go after his people, he will be their shepherd, and even he will, he will raise up the righteous branch uh, to rule his people. So that, that's what jumps out. It's just the contrast between the irresponsible shepherds and yet the Lord's persevering with his people, that he will be their shepherd. Mm-hmm. The flawed shepherds, mm-hmm. little s, and the perfect shepherd, big S, we know is Jesus. And this is a, uh, definitely a warning text, I think, to, to those called as shepherd. But I think it's also a warning text to just the, the Christian who is uh, ministering to someone in need. Mm-hmm. The basic disciples who's ministering to someone in need, like we do today in modern context, to be careful of what we're sharing with them. Exactly. Kim, what are your thoughts? Um, my first thoughts were, oh, thank goodness I'm not a pastor. <laughs> um, I mean, because you know, this, is, this would be a little scary, and I was very much comforted by the good shepherd that will um, take care of us all. But and then in my study Bible, it says that leaders are held responsible for those entrusted to their care, who has God placed in your care? Uh, remember that you're accountable to God for those people you influence and lead. And I thought about parents mm-hmm. um, who are responsible for their children and their, their education. That's the first place you learn about the Lord. Mm-hmm. And Sunday school teachers and Bible study leaders and Stephen ministers and and, and I fall into some of those categories, <laughs> and it was like, yeah, this is, this is for me, too. You mm-hmm. have to be very, very um, cognizant of responsibilities. Yeah. You know, we had a baptism this Sunday, and there's this one line in the baptismal liturgy that's very sobering. It's directed at the parents. Mm-hmm. And it's a call to them to raise their child in the faith. And then there's the warning, if you fail to do this, do you realize? You know, you will place in jeopardy your child's salvation. And, you, know, you will be held accountable, and it's just a very sobering line. And you can see it in the parents when, when you say that line of like, man, this, we're not messing around here. Like, I have a yeah. responsibility. I remember clutching my baby a little tighter going, oh, dear. Yeah. yeah. It's also a great Challenge. privilege, though, right? Oh, yeah. Like, I always go back to the, the visual. I'm very visual. So I go back to the visual of, I know how to get out of this building that's on fire. What a great privilege that I share that with uh, my coworker that's at the desk, the cubicle over from me. Mm-hmm. And that's oversimplifying the matter. But what a great responsibility, but also what a great privilege that, that we have life-saving truth, that we're not trying to figure out where and what. We already have it. I can't help, though, on this text, 
to not let the Israelites off the hook. I was reading through the first 22 chapters, and it's just back and forth. God saying, here's my word. Israelites going, yeah, it's cool for a bit. Turning away, (coughs) idolatry, sinful living. God lets them feel some pain and wrath. Keep saying, turn back to me. I will show you mercy. I'm sending you my prophets. You have my word. You have my commands. Do what's right. And the people, yeah, that's cool. But then they turn back and they turn away from God. So the way I kind of see this is a a lot of this is, yes, the, the prophets or the the, the shepherds and the, and the pastors have a great responsibility. But I, as a basic disciple, also have to be aware of what I'm listening to. Mm-hmm. I was thinking about this earlier, and when I, when I go out on a walk and I don't listen to anything, all I'm listening to is things I have to listen to. And right now it's those, I love the sound, the cicadas in the trees, and it's birds, wind, maybe some cars. I don't have to click on a, a video of someone speaking false truths about God. I mean, I can, but I think there's some ownership in the life of a, of a Christian to not always go, well, it's my pastor's fault. I'm not saying that as a pastor, but it's my pastor's fault. No, you, you don't have to sit in that church pew. You don't have to go watch that TV show or whatever it is that's feeding you. Know your Bible, know the word so that you can go, ah, oh, something doesn't sound right here, and then get away from it. You're right. I mean, how. How can we say, well, it's your responsibility to keep me on the straight and narrow, which would be a full-time job, um, if, you know, we're, we're not with you guys all the time. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, there's so many things in the world, the TV, music, social media. I sometimes find myself scrolling through social media saying, what a waste of time this was. <laughs> I, I could have been reading a book, and it doesn't even have to be a, a Christian book, but it certainly could be a better book than that. Um, you know, we have a responsibility for ourselves and then, you know, our families and our friends and maybe explaining to your friend, well, I don't watch that show. Because sure. It makes me uncomfortable. Sure. And you're in good company on that. Every time I get off Facebook, I go, well, there's 15 minutes of my life. That was a waste. If I could keep How do I get that 15 back? 15 minutes, I'd, you know, be, be content. Yes. There's an interesting twist in the text to the point y'all are making. Um, The Lord accuses the false shepherds, you have scattered my flock and driven them away. You have not attended to them. Then he turns around and says, but I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of the countries where I have driven them. So who drove them away? I mean, in verse 2, it's saying the shepherds who didn't do their duty... But in verse 3, it's saying the Lord drove them away. And we know, I mean, you pointed to this, Mark, in the greater context of there was just this back and forth, the Lord confronting his people. They repent for a little while, but then go back, just this back and forth, and eventually the Lord does drive them out of the land. He does exile them Mm -hmm. for their sin. And I don't know, I just thought that was an interesting juxtaposition there. And I, I reconcile it by saying, even through the false shepherds, the Lord accomplishes his purposes. Yeah. They were irresponsible and are held accountable. And at the same time, the consequences of their irresponsibility, the Lord wraps in and enfolds into his judgment of the people who were stiff-necked and who did not listen to his word. Mm-hmm. That part where God, and I looked at different translations as well, but that part where he said, um, where is it? I will deal with you. What verse is that? At uh, the end of verse 2, second, second part of verse 2. Yeah, I will, yeah. behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds. Oh, my goodness, does that remind me of when I was young? And my dad would be like, I'll get to you in a minute. Mm-hmm. And that was almost like, no, 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 I want to know what it's now. I want to know what the punishment <laughs> is now. They're almost like that waiting period of, oh, I'm coming for you. And the other translations were like, I will deal my judgment. I will hand out my punishment or something. But that's a very... That's a chilling reality right there. But then you were kind of going saying how the back and forth. But what I heard before where God said, you've scattered my flock and have driven them away and you've attended, you have not attended to them. I hear a hurting father's voice right there. So it's like I hear some, some compassion of God, like saying, these are my children. I mean, I love them. They're, they're my precious possession. Then I hear wrath. And then I, then I hear, oh, but. I'm going to save all you knuckleheads 
I'm sending the righteous branch. I'm showing mercy ultimately that's going to play out in all creation, culminating in Christ. Sheep, and I, I guess the people um, in the Old Testament days would understand this even better than we do, but sheep without a shepherd, without a lot of control watching over, wander off, fall off cliffs, get themselves eaten by wolves. I mean, they're really in danger. Mm -hmm. And so it takes a lot of care to look after sheep. If you neglect the sheep for a minute, you know, I just need some time to myself, um, you know, they can die. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that, uh, that that's why that image is so powerful. Have you seen the video? It's been around for a number of years, but it starts with a kid pulling the hind legs of a sheep. You realize quickly, oh, the sheep has fallen into a ditch. I mean, he's pulling hard, and you know, you're kind of rooting for him, and he gets the sheep out, and the sheep just bounds with joy and bounds and bounds and bounds, and boom, right back in the ditch right. about 20 yards up the road. I mean, right. it's, and everyone's comment when they post that video is like, yeah, that's me, like, you know. <laughs> The Lord rescues me, and there I am in the ditch again. And yet he keeps rescuing. And yet he keeps mm -hmm. rescuing, yeah. And it's, he does. And what's, what's amazing about God is that, like, to us, it was like, oh, look what that sheep did. God goes, all right, he's going to pull the sheep out. The sheep's going to take four steps and then go right back into it. And we, to true. us, it's reactionary to God. It's, it's, it's all known. I can't imagine, though, you think when Jeremiah was written and the people in exile, how they must have clung to words like this, right? They, they are experiencing the judgment of those who have been driven away, and yet clinging to those words, I will bring them back into the fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I mean, that's a straight quote from Genesis 1. I mean, going all the way back to God's original design for mankind, the Lord's going to restore that. And and boy, those are some dark days. I, I imagine they just they clung to these kind of verses that, man, I don't know how he's going to do it, but he said he'd bring us back. Mm -hmm. And that there, there are days of fruitfulness coming again. They'll no longer be afraid or terrified. Yeah. yeah. I imagine they were quite a bit. Yep. Yep. Now, what do you think? So, so I, I think about a person today, and they're still terrified and afraid in certain contexts. How do we reconcile that? Because I, I, I agree with you, Kim, that we have this peace, but it's like, yeah, but I'm still living in the world. And I'm thinking about someone who, yeah, I believe in Jesus. I'm, I'm saved by grace through faith, but I'm still feeling all this terror. Is my faith too weak? How would you respond to that? You, you included a, the word too that threw me off. Because <laughs> if you were to say, is my faith weak? I would say, yes. Your faith is weak. And, and Jesus often told his disciples, oh, you have little faith. Mm -hmm. And specifically, even when they were fearing, right? Like on a, on a stormy lake, he, he kind of corrected them, I think, in a gentle way of like, oh, you guys still don't get it. You have little faith. But when you say, is my faith too weak? At I a think, degree of... I think, yeah. no, that's not too weak. Um, be, because... The, 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 the key is not the strength of our faith. The key is the strength of the one that we trust in, mm -hmm. however feebly. Sometimes we're just barely hanging in there, but the one who holds us is strong. Yeah. And so yeah. it's not so important. Is my faith really strong? Is it really weak? Obviously, I always want to be in God's word. I want to be trusting the spirit to strengthen my faith. That's a good thing. But from day to day, my experience of how strong my faith is, it's going to waver. And there'll mm -hmm. be days it just feels like, ugh, I'm just barely hanging in there. But it's okay, because mm -hmm. the one I'm trusting is, is strong to save. Sometimes I think fear is, um, is a gift God has given us. You know, when the tornado sirens go off, I trust that God is in control, but I get in the safe room, you know, because mm -hmm. that seems like a good idea. Yeah. Human, I haul the dog normal in human, yeah. too, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, we're still afraid because we don't know, we don't understand, we're not in control. Um, we can turn our fear over to God, and we're not as afraid as people who have no hope. Yeah. And when something bad happens or we're dealing with some kind of grief, mm -hmm. it's not a product of, well, God just got weakened. God just failed. God forgot. God took the day off. No, it's just a product of the world we live in that's broken. My faith may 
ebb and flow. But God's constantly solid and aware. Like anything, anytime something happens, like the thing that happened earlier the, or over the weekend, oh my gosh, our country, yeah, our country's messed up. But God's still in control. And God is still sovereign. And this is not beyond God's knowledge or uh, power. All right, let's go to our next text here for Ephesians 2, verses 11 through 22. One more thought I just remembered on that previous text. How do we respond? How should we respond to false prophets today? How do y'all think we should respond to a false prophet or a false pastor? I, I don't like the word prophet in modern day, so I'll say false pastor. How, would we, how should we as Christians respond to someone who is falsifying God's word and misleading people. I think we have to speak up. And, and sometimes that's hard because you think, well, who am I to do this? This person you know, has been to school. They know mm-hmm. things. But if I'm looking at the Bible and I'm listening to someone and they're contradicting it, even as uh, a person in the congregation, I think we have to speak up. That's, that's scary. Talk about fear. That's scary. Sure. That's why I'm always like telling our people, read your Bible, read your Bible, be in your word, be in the, the, the solid commentaries, do your own study so that when it comes time that I say something heretical, you can go, um, excuse me, um, can we have a conversation, a sidebar over here, talk about that? And it's for my benefit too, so that I don't continue railing off into heresy. What are your thoughts, David? Uh, no, I agree. I think we do need to speak up. It's, I think, um, interesting in the day we live, because you're exposed through the internet to pastors from all over the place, from all different churches, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, I, I would say we need to distinguish between false teaching and a different interpretation. I would say there are some interpretations that are different, but historically within orthodoxy. Mm-hmm. And we ought to be careful how harshly we come against those things and just recognize that there are different faith traditions, Christian traditions that have different interpretations, which doesn't make them a false teacher. At the same time, at some point there's a line that, that, that mm-hmm. it does cross into false teaching, and, and especially when it does ha, ha, has to do with the person of Christ, of who he is, um, that we must speak up about that. And, and I think we should always do it charitably. We should always do it, but we should do it clearly. Um, and so I, I think it gets a little interesting when it's within your tr- particular, in our case, the LCMS, um, because we are under authority and there are channels that we are to go through, right? That if I know someone's teaching falsely, uh, I can confront them. I can go to our church leadership. Um, But there is always, I think, some wisdom on what has the Lord called me to do? He certainly called me to care for the people who are under my care, and I definitely speak to them, right? I address it with them directly because I am responsible to teach them the truth. Mm-hmm. When it's in other churches, I, I do think there is a, is a pause to say, am I, the, am I the one that God has placed in authority in this situation to address that? And oftentimes the answer is no. There are those who are in authority who are responsible for addressing. Yeah. So that's, that's probably way too complicated of an answer to a pretty straightforward question. But it does raise up. It's not as simple as simply, uh, yes, we must speak up and, and teach the truth and help our people identify, hey, do you understand this popular preacher here? He, he, is, he is wrongly teaching the Bible when it comes yeah. to these issues. I think that's important because our people are exposed to all these different teachers. Sure. I think, I mean, I remember listening to a speaker once who was talking about the story of the loaves and the fishes that we'll get to later on this, this afternoon. And she said, well, you don't have to believe that an actual miracle took place. Maybe there was just a little food and the people were, 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 were shared what little they had, and they were, um, you know, they were content with what the little because they were so um, overwhelmed by the, the teaching and their love for one another and so on. And I'm looking and saying, hungry people are just not that nice, number one. And, and, <laughs> They're and, angry. And, 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 and number, number two, and the Bible's usually pretty clear about what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, and if they say, Everyone ate and was satisfied. I'm going to go with that. Now, I didn't have a chance to speak to that speaker, but if I had, I would have said, do you not believe in the miracle of the, of the lo- loaves and fishes? You know, um, 
is this something that you really feel strongly about? What about miracles in the Bible? And tried to engage in a discussion to see what they were actually talking about. Sure. Um, but that, to me, would be an example of false teaching. Yeah. And, and that's a great specific yeah. example, Kim, because on one hand, you could say, you know, they're just, I mean, it doesn't have to be. The, what's the problem? The problem is, if you can't believe Jesus could multiply some food, oh, you can't. You're not going to believe the incarnation, the resurrection. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's a that's a little thing compared to mm-hmm. the big things of the yeah. faith. And how many times do we find whether this teacher was there yet already? But when you start there, I got to eliminate this miracle somehow. You'll eventually get to the resurrection. You'll eventually get to. Yeah. Oh, it's just a spirit. It's coming kind of like spring and new birth of a flower, and that's all the resurrection is. Yeah, we do. The, 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 he resurrected himself in their minds and, right. and so on. Yes, when you start questioning the existence of the miracles, it doesn't matter which one you start with. It is, a, it is the row of dominoes that you just knock mm. over. And it goes back to what you were saying, Pastor Bray, in terms of how do we view God's word? You know, we need to be hearing God's word. But do we even view it as something worth hearing? You know, mm-hmm. because if it's something I just have to kind of explain away, I, I don't know. I, yeah, yeah, and I think in in just to kind of tag on the end of this, if we are in fellowship with someone who is speaking, like let's say it's within your own congregation, someone you have human face to face contact with, I think we have to handle it properly, address it very delicately, like the scripture says, when you have a beef with someone, you know, go to them directly, bring a brother, that type of stuff. And then our ultimate hope is to restore them, restore them to the right truth and the right living so that, because I think nothing's worse than you have a heretical preacher, the world comes at him, torches him, and then he eventually goes, I'm out of the faith, I'm done, and leaves it all together because of some bad mistake he made in the way the world reacted around him. Um, but that doesn't mean we, we, we take the false teaching and go, it's okay. Mm-hmm. We still have to address that, which, growth. Growth. All right, let's look, let's look at our epistle lesson here, Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. Therefore, remember that, one, that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you are at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. For through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. All right, Kim, I'm going to go to you first here. What jumps out here? To you, a um, couple things. One is that um, apparently calling people uncircumcised or the uncircumcised was like calling them, you know, you heathens, right. you, you you Neanderthals, you cavemen. It was it was a very rude way to to refer to people. But look at the words that were true of the uh, Gentiles: separate, excluded, foreigners, without hope. Um, that's just horribly depressing. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Jewish people had the law and couldn't keep it, but the Gentiles didn't even have the law, (laughs) so they didn't even know what they were supposed to keep. And then in verse 14, we get to, for he himself is our peace, and I read that that could be interpreted as wholeness. That that version of the peace word peace meant wholeness. Mm -hmm. So instead of being alienated and separated and excluded, now we have wholeness, Christ which is, you know, speaking as a Gentile, very, very reassuring. <laughs> yeah. And those words you, you mentioned there, like separated, alienated, having no, like, I think, we, I think we downplay those words until we've felt what that really feels like. Mm-hmm. 
of truly being alienated and truly being separated. I think about sometimes I watch a lot of prison documentaries. I don't know why just the psychology of that environment fascinates me. And I think about what would it be like to be separated from society and have no ability to get back to society? Like I, I can separate myself from my house, but I always have the ability to open the door and walk out. I mean, I want to, but I have the ability. I wonder like, when you think about it, when I think about that perspective of being locked up and I truly cannot, that's suffocating. That kind of, that makes me very, very uh, claustrophobic and I don't like thinking about it. So I, I think those words are profound and we often gloss over them. David, what are your thoughts on this? One thing that stands out, those first two words, therefore remember, in the first 10 verses of Ephesians 2 is these great gospel proclamation of us being just utterly lost, saved by grace through faith. So this, this great gospel that has reconciled us to God has implications in our relationships with one another. So that therefore, remember, hey, in light of what God has done in the gospel, that has implications on how we live with one another, right? That has implications with how we relate to Jews and Gentiles and those we consider different from us, that the gospel has some horizontal application, that it brings reconciliation and brings peace between those who were once divided, who were once hostile towards one another. So just a reminder that the gospel kind of runs both ways. And it's interesting, like this concept was talking about the, the differences between these groups, and correct me if I'm wrong, based on like lineage and heritage. But they also probably looked different in some way. In some kind of, I would imagine, I, I would imagine back then you could look and say, oh, that person's a Jew and that person's a Gentile without even speaking to them and just kind of get indicators. And it's interesting how they had this, they, they had this separation today. And so I try to pull this into modern day context and I think about where today do we do this without maybe even being aware that we do it? Like no one walks around and says Jew and Gentile, but where in our world today do we create these divisions where we say, all right, well, you are, are, are entitled to God's grace and you're, you're with us. You are not based on some criteria I've created. Thoughts on that? And I didn't tell you, I was, I was, that just came to me now, so unfair question, but what are your thoughts on that? I, I'm always upset when I hear people saying such negative things about teenagers in general. I, I was at a, an event and someone said, oh, you don't want to go, go that way. A bunch of teenagers are down there. It's like, you know, they have knives. <laughs> they, just, and I went, I went in that direction and they were perfectly polite. Yeah. Um, but we act as if certain people somehow are not, um, not as, as uh, uh, Christian as we are or as, um, uh, as worthy of being, um, being called by Christ's name. Mm-hmm. You know, if someone walked in with a leather jacket and a bunch of tattoos, um, we might say, well, we'd say, come over and sit with us. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, uh, you know, you might look at them funny. Um, sure. We look at people who worship differently sometimes, uh, askance. Like, what are you doing jumping around? What is that? Uh, I'm a Lutheran. We don't jump. <laughs> <laughs> Unless there's a snake, in which case, yes. Uh, I think we're, we're, we're to be judgmental and exclusive. Here's my group. These, these are what, this is what people of God look like. Mm-hmm. And I think the Jewish people perhaps had every reason to think that. They were God's chosen people. And um, they weren't too sure about these other people. What do you mean we're opening the doors to everybody? And in this church, what do we mean we open the doors to everybody? That guy's homeless and he smells. Mm-hmm. No, God said everybody. Yeah, well said. David, what are your thoughts here? It it seems like the other can be anyone that makes me uncomfortable. And so typically it is. People that maybe look a little different, dress a little different, don't bathe as often as I think that would be good to bathe for whatever reason. You know, their appearance, their worship practices. Um, I, I, I tend to think countries that are at odds with the United States, it's just helpful for me to remember there are Christians. Mm-hmm. There are Christians in Russia, in Iran, in China, who are, are brothers and sisters in Christ. And, and 
that doesn't mean nations ought not relate to one another as nations, or but, but it just is a reminder to not treat people all as a group and then reject them and consider them other, right? Sure. They're on the mm-hmm. other side of the wall, and, and I'm not comfortable with them on this, this side. Sure. I mean, even as, as close as Mexico, we could start there and say that, like, unless I'm in a role of, this is how I, I look at it, unless I'm in a government role where I am, God has placed me in this role and empowered me to enforce the laws of the land, I kind of tend to think that my response to people that are coming from another country that are brothers and sisters in the faith is charity, is kindness. Now, I don't want to get into the, all the civil, you know, I'm not going down that road, but I can't do anything to change actual government policy other than voting. So I think, what can I do that's good fruit towards people who look different than me or, 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 or bathe different than me or have different economic status or whatever to me? And I think Jesus says, honor the law of the land, yes, but be charitable, be kind, be loving. Start with that and then see where the Spirit moves. He has brought them all together. And one of the most powerful things I ever heard, um, I was at a, a women's conference, and it was just after Russia had invaded, invaded Ukraine, mm-hmm. and a Ukrainian pastor had, was live feed talking to us about what was going on, and he talked about you know, saying goodbye to his family in the morning, and they didn't know if they were going to be getting back together that evening mm-hmm. and so on. And um, the woman who was interviewing him said, how can we pray for you? And he said, I'd really like you to pray for some of these Russian soldiers. Mm. They're no more than kids. They've been, you know, lied to about the situation and circumstance. Um, you know, they're, they're dying. Their families are waiting for them. He said, we have a lot of uh, problems with the people in the government, but these are our brothers and sisters, and yeah. they need prayer. And I thought, that is what Christianity is all about. Yeah. That is a man of Christ. Yeah. Wow, the spirit working through that man in that moment, because you know the flesh wants to just blanket hate yes, someone who's hate destroying them. your country. But yeah, just got goosebumps talking about it again. Yeah, that's that's awesome. Would you, as you were talking, that phrase, um, verse nineteen. But you are fellow citizens with the mm-hmm. saints, and we just share a citizenship in the kingdom of God uh, with people from all different lands. Yeah, and it's right here and now. Like it's it's so easy to see division and difference and reason to hate each other, but in reality, there's this fellow citizenship, this brotherhood, this sisterhood, this family that God has called us to as a greater Christian church. That oh, how much better would it be to focus on that than focus on all the reasons why we should hate each other, or we're being fed that we should hate each other based on whatever a media outlet is saying. Yeah. Any other thoughts here? I guess to kind of wrap this one, I see a lot of stuff being done for me. Mm -hmm. I didn't didn't bring myself into the family. I didn't end my alien or stranger status. I didn't make myself a fellow citizen. I didn't create that peace. It wasn't my blood that sanctified the problem. It was all done for me. I remember it's like the first, I was in a new school and I was just standing there terrified, you know, in the cafeteria, and a group of girls said, come sit with us. Mm. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing refuge. Oh, yeah. They were my friends for the rest of my time mm. at school. <laughs> it's amazing. I can totally relate to that. High school lunchroom. It's amazing how much love can be felt by simply saying, hey, come sit with us. Like, come into our dome of, of safety here. Yeah. <laughs> it's just a social thing, mm-hmm. but it's, it's amazing. All right, let's go to our our last reading here is our gospel text, Mark 6, 30 to 44. And this is, the Kim, the reading you alluded to earlier, Jesus Jesus feeding the 5,000. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. And many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. 
send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. And they said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? And he said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. And he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven, said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the, the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate loaves were five thousand men. All right, David, thoughts? You know, something that struck me this time, I've always loved this story, but I don't know that I'd ever really paid attention before, the condition of the disciples. So they've just returned. Jesus had sent them out two by two to do ministry. So they've had this great mission trip they've returned from. If you've ever taken a mission trip, like with youth, you realize it's an amazing faith-stretching time, and it's exhausting. So they come back. And Jesus recognizes that, it appears. He says, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while. Because it said there was just so much coming and going, they didn't even have time to eat. So I can't imagine these disciples. They've had this great spiritual high, this great, amazing seeing God work. They come back, they're exhausted, they're going to a retreat, and they show up, and there's a crowd of people. (laughs) And then Jesus just picks right up and starts teaching them again, and it comes that night, and they're like, can we please just send them away now? And then he says, you give them something to eat. I can't, like, I can't imagine the inward groan of like, oh, like, I don't know. I have, I have a little more compassion of the disciples going into the story and the lesson they're about to learn. And uh, most of the, 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 the texts that I looked at, you know, the disciples still hadn't learned to trust Jesus and to have faith. But, you know, I, I don't know that we're, we're supposed to be demanding miracles every time we turn around. You know, mm-hmm. there are hungry people here. Um, we're not supposed to say, hey, you take care of it. You're the miracle guy. Um, they didn't know what to do. How do you, how do you, what circumstances they were, they, they, they must have been terribly confused and exhausted, probably hungry themselves. And it's interesting in 36, they said, send them away. Like, we can't instruct them. And I get it. They were there to see Jesus. So maybe it was the fact that the crowd, even if the disciples had said, go get some food, they were going to be like, no, I'm here to see him. Don't tell me what to do. Or I don't want to miss what, he, what might occur here. But, that, it, but it's, a very, it's a very normal human reaction. I mean, I, I think that even occurs today. Lord, do something here. And it doesn't seem to me like Jesus doesn't leave them hanging very long, right? He says, you give them something to eat. And they respond like, what? Like, are we supposed to go spend all this money? We're like, this is impossible. And he quickly comes to, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And I, There's just such a beauty of this story. Five loaves and two fish, which is just not laughably Not even enough insufficient. for them. Right, <laughs> right. So, like, it, it's almost like... They, <laughs> I'm curious at what point did they start to clue in? I, my guess is they still haven't clued in. They're like, all right, Jesus is going to be stubborn about this. We'll prove to him we don't have enough, right? They bring it back to him, and then obviously you know, Jesus steps in, and with Jesus it's enough. Um, so I don't know. I just, I, I, I'm very compassionate towards the disciples, um, but I also I very much, because I am one of the disciples, that immediately thinks this isn't practical, the math doesn't work, this can't happen. Jesus is being unrealistic, you know, and just how, but, but Jesus is compassionate. He brings them along. He walks them through it. You know, he gives them something they can do. Go see how much you have. Okay, I, I can do that. See, clearly not enough. And then, boom, he's going to not only feed the people, he, he's going to continue to open the eyes of his disciples. And I, I keep thinking about Jesus handing the food to give to the disciples, and every time Someone goes to Jesus, you know, I gave out that food. Here's more food. Sometimes I feel that way in my life. I ask Jesus for one thing, and I keep getting things. It's more and more and more and, and, and more. Where is all this stuff coming from? And um, this big worry I had turns into rejoicing. Mm-hmm. And I, I imagine the disciples going through that as well. 
Yeah, and there's no, like you said earlier, Kim, there's no promise that God's going to do something miraculous. But I can draw to these stories and say, okay, my gosh, if God can do this, I have comfort in knowing that this illness I'm facing, maybe God will, this head cold, maybe God will bring me healing at some point. Like, it gives me perspective on what God is capable of. doesn't mean God's going to do what I ask, but it, it gives me comfort that I'm appealing to God Almighty that does things like this, that are, a mir- that are absolute mm-hmm. miracles. That's the God I'm talking to. And in that, okay, I'm going to the right source. And, and what I'm struck by is, is Jesus said, you give them something to eat. And the first thing they thought is, my resources are inadequate. Mm-hmm. Well, sometimes we feel God leading us to do something, and we're going, my resources are inadequate. And, um, but we have to remember that God keeps providing, even when we don't yeah. know. And it's good they went to Jesus, right? Mm-hmm. We want to get really weird on this. They could have been like, don't bother him. He's tired. Let's just figure it out on our own. And they try to figure it out on their own. They obviously fail miserably at it. But there wasn't a solution they could have come to, I don't think. Yeah. But such comfort, right? Because I think God consistently calls us to things that are far beyond our resources. Mm-hmm. And, and he doesn't ask. And what? how many times, and I've heard this among our elders and certainly pastors, we're called at different times to go walk into difficult situations. And often as we're entering that situation, you're just thinking, man, I got no idea what to say. I have no idea. And you go in with what feels like a breadcrumb, like, oh, I got this little verse, but, you know. But you come right back to this of, all right, Jesus, <laughs> here I am. This feels overwhelming. I feel completely inadequate. But I'm here. Like, I'm here. So help. And, and you find again and again and again when Jesus is present, it's enough, mm-hmm. right? So much is just showing up and saying, I'm inadequate. And Jesus says, good. <laughs> That's, mm-hmm. I got you where I need you. Good. My right? strength is made perfect in weakness. Yes. yes. <laughs> we don't like it. It's uncomfortable for us. It's uncomfortable. But for Jesus, it's like, good. You're not going to get in the way with all your plans, trying to figure it all out. <laughs> You show up empty-handed, you show up open-handed, and you say, all right, Jesus, somehow, some way, use these words, use this verse, use this presence to accomplish what needs to be done. Yeah, that last one is one of the ones I love the most is presence. Like, I don't have to go in with profound wisdom or, or the, the, I found the greatest verse. I can speak God's word, but sometimes just being present with someone and just sitting there just watching the world go by, mm-hmm. just being with each other, God works amazing comfort in those, in those things. So don't be afraid of the awkward silence. Like we were talking in our book class this morning, don't be afraid of the awkward silence. <laughs> so the last thing that, that I'll, I'll pull out on this, and I have never caught this, but as I was reading this, I, I thought, why is that in there? And then I had this kind of aha moment. Verse 39, then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. Why does it matter if it's green grass? And then my mind went to Psalm 23. In Psalm 23, where God says, he makes me lie down in green pastures. Oh, and that's such a comfort and a care psalm. I thought, that's interesting. I may be stretching the text, but that's interesting how this is a, this is a miraculous moment, but it's also a very comforting moment. Like it says, Jesus had compassion on them. And there's, there's such that theme that follows Jesus around of compassion and care and love. Sitting down on the green grass, like they're even sitting on a comfortable place, and it's that, that reminder that God, God provides and cares for us and will ultimately care for us in the life to come. And why did he have compassion? Because he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. We just read in Jeremiah. Ties right into Psalm 23. Mm -hmm. The sheep without a shepherd, he has now come to be the good shepherd to provide for you. I picked up one thing when I was looking at commentaries, because knowing I was going to sit with two pastors is just a little intimidating. (laughs) And it said, uh, the 12 basketfuls Mm -hmm. of broken bread and fish that were left over, one for each disciple. Mm. You're talking about not being too concerned about awkward Silence. I think there was an awkward silence there as they're all holding their basket. <laughs> and, uh, and I think the mix of emotion, right? The mix of 
oh, I'm embarrassed now because of course Jesus could do this. But I think there's also the, this is incredible to walk with Jesus. It, he could do this such a thing. And, and then there's the grace of like, um, I don't remember if it came out in this text. It comes out in one of the tellings of the story. Uh, I'll find it here. It doesn't say it explicitly here. In one of the other tellings, it explicitly says the disciples basically serve the meal. So he just, Jesus tells them, you give them something to eat, and they did. Eventually they did. They were the conduits of Jesus' miracle to deliver it to the people. And again, I think as you're holding that basket, you're like, wow, me of little faith, and yet God's grace is great. He still works through me. Is that foreshadowing his death, resurrection, and ascension? Like, you give them something to eat. It's almost like, as you were saying that, I was thinking, man, he's kind of preparing them and preparing the people to listen to them and to see the word of God come through these disciples yeah. who were just bums. Yeah. It's, I don't know. Maybe I'm stretching that. No, but I think of Jesus' words of restoration to Peter. What did he tell yeah, him three yeah, times? Yeah. Feed my sheep, yeah. right? So, yeah. Very interesting. You think you know these stories and you think you've talked about them enough, and then you talk about them and you see how, how much there's just continued richness in these. Well, one thing I appreciate, you brought this out, Mark, of just noticing the green grass. We should read the Bible that way. It's a highly edited book in the sense of we know lots of stories didn't make it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what John says. Like, man, I would have filled up the books of the whole world if I'd included mm -hmm. everything. So when they do include something, they included it for a reason. Yeah. They didn't have extra words. They didn't need filler to please their eighth grade English teacher, right? They didn't have a word processor either. It was right. a little more complicated. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Um, and so, so we ought to pay attention to those details. And when you do, it, it tends to continue to just the depth. We, we never get to the bottom of it. It just continues to open up new insights. And kind of a, uh, to, to add to that, I think one of, the, one of the, and this goes back to like you're enjoying the, the, the Bible group, is reading it out loud and reading it slowly. Helps us, I think, helps us get these little, you know, what do we call them? Easter eggs, where the kids call mm -hmm. when there's an Easter egg in a game or something. Yeah. Like these little Easter eggs of, oh, I didn't see that. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it brings more of the richness forth. Any final thoughts? All right. Good readings today. Come on, worship with us this Sunday. Thanks for joining us on this podcast. We put these out every week. So if you're brand new to this, um, every Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday, you'll see something. I, I'm not that predictable. So it may be Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. Check YouTube and it'll be out there. Uh, we'll catch y'all at worship uh, this coming Sunday. Y'all have a good one.